بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمده وأصلي على رسول الكريم uh, I am very very honored to have a very very special guest uh, Brother Kevin uh, Barrett did I see it right? Absolutely uh, Okay and so um, he has a PhD in Islamic studies he is he he is and was one of the foremost in talking about 9-11 truth um he he's been a true mujahid intellectually speaking a true speaker of uh and and so he has a lot of insight he's interviewed some amazing people who are who also have insight so i mean you know he's um he's an intellectual and so brother kevin if we can inshallah before we talk about world politics and what's happening Maybe we could talk about Russia, USSR, and versus, you know, uh, sorry, Russia and NATO and that whole. Maybe we could talk about that. Uh, I'll just throw that out there for maybe you to consider. But before we talk about politics, let's talk about you and how you became Muslim, uh, just so that people have kind of like, you know, some personal aspect of understanding of your, your story. Sure. Uh, bismillah. Uh, that's, um, I became Muslim in uh, 1993, uh, and I, I come from a kind of a, a white Midwestern uh, quasi-Protestant background with my parents being lapsed Unitarians, which is as lapsed as it gets. Uh, they took me to the Frank Lloyd Wright Unitarian Church a couple of times in Madison, Wisconsin, and that was it as far as any real uh, religious training. Um, I did have a grandmother who was a bit of a nature mystic uh, after people like Thoreau and, uh, and Wordsworth and so on. But uh, I grew up without much conception of, uh, of what the monotheists were talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And the Christianity didn't exactly, didn't make sense to me. Uh, the do dogmas about the Trinity and so on uh, seemed very uh, strange and irrational, and the sort of anthropomorphic images of God as a human being struck me as, as, as strange uh, and seemed kind of obviously mythological, right? I mean, if if rabbits, you know, imagined a God, it would look like a rabbit, and so the humans were doing the same thing. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, when I was young, I had these kinds of you know, mystical intimations of there being a much larger world than you know the material world and, and more than intimations really so uh, i kind of was you know trying to find the truth but growing up in this society you're brainwashed to believe in progress through secularism and you're brainwashed to accept a material a materialist worldview and i knew the materialist worldview was wrong from personal experience early on but I still kept kind of having to, uh, you know, to, to struggle with the larger narrative of secular progress. And I kind of naturally drifted to the left politically based on uh, the Vietnam War and then discovering that, you know, JFK had been killed in a coup d'etat by militarists, perhaps Zionists as well. At the time, I just knew the militarists. So anyway, I, I was sort of uh, a bit lost. Uh, and what woke me up, I think more than anything else, was discovering the traditionalist movement and uh, Rene Guénon in particular. Oh, okay. Yes. And that, so that others yeah. I've been interviewing, uh, Charles Upton. Yes. Uh, yes. I think he's studied him too, which is interesting. Oh, yeah. Yes. He's, he's, he traveled a kind of a, a path a lot like mine in certain respects. Um, so that maybe with both of you together, and that would be interesting. I'd love to do that. I love talking with him. I've had him on my show many times. And I, I respect him. Oh, mashallah. Okay, okay, mashallah. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Rene Guénon and the traditionalists uh, are are good deprogramming for people who've been brought up to believe in progress, uh, and also that opened me up to the possibility of monotheism being more than just you know sort of irrationally worshiping a, a big old you know human daddy in the sky. Uh, and then um, uh, after a series of coincidences, such as, I mean, it was a coincidence that I even learned of Guénon and traditionalism. I walked into the wrong classroom, and that was what was being taught, and I decided to stay 
and not take the class that I was looking for. <laughs> uh, and then uh, another series of coincidences in or synchronicities or, you know, IAT or whatever you want to call Carl it. Carl uh, Jung, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, these these times when, you know, when, when Allah sort of gives you an extra nudge, right? A little extra, it feels like <laughs> guidance or, or sort of a wake up call. <laughs> Uh, and so then in, in 93, uh, I took a, a second look at Islam mm -hmm. and you know, through books, fall, the right books fell into my hands at the moment that uh, I decided to marry a Muslim woman. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the rest was very, very easy, really. Um, and it's not easy doing it right. You know, it's a struggle to be a better person according to the Islamic tradition. But uh, but it's it's also a very natural uh, path, and so, alhamdulillah, it's been a very interesting, <laughs> wonderful exploration. May Allah open more doors for you, inshallah. 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 And uh, I mean, the work you're doing so is so important that I hope, inshallah, it wakes people up, shakes people up, and you know. Um, so, Bismillah. Let's talk about Russia, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> so, what do you want to hear about Russia? Well, I mean, how do you read the whole scenario? And uh, you know, with the with the pipelines now blown up, uh, this is really. I mean, it seems like everything is escalating, and so I just want to maybe get an idea of how you think things are going to. How like it's like you know, um, Weber said the the dice has been cast, kind of thing. Uh, so. I wonder how you're looking at this in terms of Islamic eschatology, uh, at a political science level. Where, where, where is this war, and what do you think? Where this is—is is this going to just keep escalating? Yeah, I, uh, my only real knowledge of eschatology comes out of what I've learned from Sheikh Imran Hossein, uh, supplemented a little bit by my looking into the uh, sort of Jewish messianic uh, heresies uh, coming out of Shabtai V, the false messiah and Sabbateanism and the relationship to, to various Freemasonic cults and so on, that, that whole side of things. But mostly I, I uh, have studied uh, some of Sheikh Imran's work. I had the good fortune to meet him in person a few times and study with him for a month or so in Malaysia a few years back. And I think he's, my, I, I think he's uh, very, uh, insightful and very lightly, very very likely on the right track, uh, in his view. And of course, his view is that we're living uh, pretty close to Akhir Zaman, if not you know somewhere in the middle of Akhir Zaman, and the Melhama or the nuclear war that will kill a large proportion of humanity, according to him, is fairly close. In fact, the day I met him. He, uh, I'd, I'd walked into a conference room in Tehran, sat down, and then I noticed that sitting next to me was Sheikh Imran Hussein, uh, whom I had never met in person before. Uh, and I was very pleased to meet him, and he uh, he was happy to see me too. We I'd done radio interviews with him before, and he, uh, the first thing he said to me was, "I had this dream last night that in the Melhama is much closer, you know, much much closer than I realized." And uh, so we we talked a lot about that at that point. And, How long uh, ago was this, if you don't mind? Well, that was a while. That was like 20, oh, maybe 2013 or 14. Mm. Uh, I think possibly 2015. I, I went to Iran once or twice a year, every year from 2013 through 2019. And so I get those trips mixed up. If the FBI ever tries to interrogate me, and they actually have about this, <laughs> uh, I, I would, uh, I, I wouldn't actually, I didn't, I refuse to talk to them without a tape recorder. So then they, they said, we can't do that. So I've never been interrogated by the FBI about my trip to Iran. If I ever were, I would have a hard time because I wouldn't remember for sure which thing happened which year. And then they would probably charge me with lying to the FBI and send me to Guantanamo. But anyway, so this was one of those years uh, and I can't swear which one it was. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he, uh, so uh yeah he thought the melhama was was very close and it just looks closer and closer you know with uh what we're seeing now clearly the um the dajjal inspired uh zionist american empire or some call it the anglo-zionist empire the empire of usury the empire of riba banking which mm -hmm. is trying to take over the world uh which does seem to be uh inspired by shaitan that force 
uh, seems to be pushing this war on Russia uh, as part of its attempt to stave off uh, its collapse and to try to uh, uh, essentially get into a position to take over the world. So I, I see this as a war of aggression against Russia through Ukraine and, and other places as well. I think Sheikh Imran Hussein is probably right that the uh, the Western Reba forces are, are indeed satanically inspired. Uh, and uh, one of the clues that that's the case among many is the way the media, it lies so outrageously. The, mm. the Western media is able to get away with just insane, outrageous, obvious lies about so many things uh, because they control the media. And the Russians don't lie that much. I mean, yeah, I'm sure they probably do lie strategically occasionally, but if you read Putin's speeches, he's basically calling it the way it is. Yeah, and the most recent speech I heard was very daring and courageous. Yes, yes. He's, so, <laughs> so we are seeing a certain clash of lies versus truth. And to what extent that's because the, the, the side that's more truthful is uh, is inspired, you know, by, by part of the Hezbollah, the party in the larger sense, the party of Allah, and uh, the other side is the party of Shaitan, or whether partly it's due to sort of just the natural arrogance of a, a power that's been a, a planetary hegemon for mm -hmm. some time and wants to keep it that way and, and become even stronger. Uh, it's it's you know sort of hard. You know, you can analyze it eschatologically, or you can analyze it just you know, politically in terms of what you see happening, but they both kind of line up for me. And so I, I do see this as uh, it's, it's obvious that the narrative that the, we're seeing in the West is absolutely, you know, upside down, black is white, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And uh, it's just lies, 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 lies. Uh, and, and so I, I sympathize with the uh, the, the position of Russia and to some extent Iran and China, well, actually to a great extent Iran and, and, a, and then a certain extent China as well, in that these nations seem to be pushing back against the global empire of Riba. Uh, they all have their faults. They all have issues. The Ru Russia has a fair bit of corruption um, and civilizational decline after their communist experience. And China is, uh, is corrupted by their materialism. Um, and Iran uh, is has less problematic, but it's it's got its problems too, of course. But at least these Big three countries. The problem that I see in Iran is that they're losing their ideological foothold mm -hmm. that they started with. Yes. Uh, from the revolution of 1979, I think those original, you know, vanguards of the revolution that has declined and i think the materialism of the west has seeped in and i think they need to work on their ideological principles with the masses mm -hmm. uh, yes much more. yes i i, I agree you know, it's it's a very uh, pluralistic society there i uh, noticed even the the mullahs uh, in Iran have wild, very different views from each other. So it's not like a sort of totalitarian state yeah. with this one party line. And and then a, a lot of people are very secular and don't particularly like the Islamic Republic. That would be maybe a, a quarter or at the most of the population, but they're overrepresented in the media because they're wealthy. They have connections with the exiles in Los Angeles. Uh, and now the CIA is stirring up riots in Iran uh, so yeah, but you're right. They yeah. they do need to sort of recoup their ideological uh, uh, energy. And what's happened with Shiaism itself? Uh, one of the intellectuals, maybe you heard of his name, Ali Shariati. Oh yes, of course. So Ali Shariati, as you know, he divides Shiaism into the black and the red, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think there's uh, they have lost that red. Uh, they're more in the the ritualistic mourning. Uh, that is given, that has had a rise, especially, you know, this movie that came out, I forget what it's called, um, in England, this this movie that came out about uh, how Fatima was killed by Abu Bakr. You, you probably, I don't remember the name of the Lady Fatima. Yeah. Uh, that shows that uh, one of the ways that's being used to sabotage Iran is by by giving uh, and discrediting 
uh, you can say ayat, the ayatollahs in Khum is by this more extreme ritualistic uh, ritualistic uh, Shiaism rather than the Shiaism that is standing up. You know, Hussein, radiallahu does he stand up for justice? That aspect is 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 less has become less important uh, versus the the crying over the fact that we lost the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Anyway. Yes. There, there's still a fair bit of that uh, commitment to justice. The, the people I have met in Tehran, the people who brought me there, are very much part of that group that is committed to justice. Well, yes, of course. Uh, I think that uh, at the government level, international level, institutional level, they would be the van. They would still be there, uh, mm. but it's it's the places where those other religious influences that are not part of the center so to say that are that's what the i think partly u.s is using to sabotage iran internally yes that makes a lot of sense in the same way that some of sort of quietist wahhabis and and uh and sell out sufis and you know all sorts of uh tendencies that are helpful to for the empire of dajjal have been sponsored and funded and encouraged uh, and then those the truth speaking and the justice seeking that opposes the empire of Dajjal is of course uh, discouraged, and uh, they they do everything they can to stop that message from getting out. So let's go back to Russia. So um, let me ask you, what do you think about Alexander Dugin? I met him uh, also. Actually, I met him in Palm, I think, uh, or no, no, in Meshhad, in Meshhad, and. Um, I uh, kind of bonded with him actually quickly. He he approached me and after I'd talked a little bit, I think I'd mentioned uh, being inspired by Rene Guénon and he told me he was too. He said his his whole career was based on uh, discovering Rene Guénon. So we we had a great conversation. I, I like the man. He's uh, you know he's one of he's he's kind of a, a Russian visionary. You know in the tradition of people people like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky who are among my favorite writers. Uh, and I think his his view, which of course Charles Upton, you know, points out the weaknesses and the problems in, in his view, and and that's legitimate. There are legitimate critiques, but overall, I think uh, his notion of uniting the different forces that are opposed to this globalist empire of Reba uh, is uh, kind of a no brainer. <laughs> You don't have to be a genius Heideggerian to figure that out. Uh, but so he's, I think he's very, like Sheikh Amran Hussein, I think he's he's barking up the right tree. Uh, and, uh, and he seems like a very good man. And I really feel for him you know, losing his daughter in that uh, horrific assassination. You know, when, when this, when the empire has to kill uh, the family members of philosophers, and it has to blow up the infrastructure pipelines uh, and send... Uh, the most potent greenhouse gas into the atmosphere and starve and freeze the people of its supposed European allies, you know that empire is getting uh, desperate. desperate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't, I think that in some ways this desperation is natural because that shows who, that the movers and shakers feel cornered. Yes, and as well they should. Yeah, they should, because if the dollar gets challenged, it's game over, right? I mean, is that what yes. you Yeah, I agree completely. I, I am fully on board with that analysis. People like Michael Hudson have fleshed this out in, in great detail, uh, how the, uh, the dollar has been grossly overvalued and become a, a tool of, of empire that they, it, it's, a, it's an unprecedented situation historically. In the past, whichever empire could uh, get the most gold uh, and then use that to build up their produc production, their military would dominate the world. Uh, and so every nation would fight to have the strongest kind of gold backed uh, currency. And now the US has somehow managed to trick the world into accepting fiat currency that has no backing whatsoever. And of course that's ha happened after Nixon and Kissinger engineered uh, getting off of the gold standard. So uh it's it's a, a kind of a scam and a bit of a ponzi scheme as well that's allowed them to print as much green paper as they like and force the rest of the world at gunpoint to accept it for real goods and services so that's how the u.s empire operates that's why they have the money 
to put more than 800 military bases in 130 countries around the world and try to occupy and take over the entire world for the usury uh, gangsters and banksters of the masters of Reba who run the big financial investment houses and are total parasites. As, as Michael Hudson points out, these people are all rent seekers or usury seekers, the people who are grabbing money based on the fact that they already have money without doing work for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the ways we can think about the problem of usury. So that, that scam, obviously, it has a limited duration if the people who are being swindled uh, get tired of it and get the power to do something about it. And the Western portion of the global GDP has been declining precipitously. It was uh, 60 some percent not so long ago, and it's heading for something like 15 or 20 percent, I think, uh, in uh, the not too distant future. So they, they're not going to have the resources to defend this grossly iniquitous arrangement very long. And the, the rest of the world that's been swindled uh, by this and has been paying for their own occupation, paying for this US military that is strangling the entire world by uh, being forced to give real goods and services for worthless green paper, uh, they're tired of it. Russia is tired of it. China is tired of it. Iran is tired of it. A lot of other people, a lot of other countries are tired of it, even if they don't stand up and say so quite so loudly. And so naturally, the, the people running the empire see that how, how is this going to continue? How can we keep forcing the world to take our dollars? How can we expand our military presence? How can we completely squash all opposition? Uh, and they see that they're facing a, a losing battle. And so they're desperate and they're doing all sorts of crazy things. They're lashing out. You know, they're cornered rats. Uh, and of course, cornered rats are very dangerous. And that's why the possibility of a nuclear melhama, I think, is a very real one. Um, you know, they, these are reckless moves. 9-11, the false flag of 9-11 was a really crazy reckless move, although that was mostly about saving Israel. And the uh, what we've seen since uh, is one series of reckless moves after another and provoking Russia into this war by forcing NATO into Ukraine, refusing to negotiate in good faith. That was all extremely reckless. And now this uh, blowing up the pipeline um, is uh, beyond reckless. And I guess we could also mention the reckless move of attacking China and Iran with a biological weapon, which then bounced back and became the COVID pandemic. That was a little bit reckless too. Uh, Ron Unz just published a great article about this today, comparing the, the pipeline uh, <laughs> uh, uh, terrorism to the uh, biological attack on Iran and China. Uh, so clearly these neocons who are running the US empire are, are getting desperate, they're lashing out, they're doing crazy things. And these things they're doing are not, don't, I don't see how that's going to help them that much. You know, how, how, is, how is this COVID pandemic really going to preserve the empire in the long term? I don't see it. How, how is destroying Europe's economy going to help the U.S. empire in the long term? It may prop up the dollar in the short term as, as the European currency flees into the U.S. dollar, but in the, even the medium term, even in just a few years down the line, how, what's going to happen? Is, your, is Europe really going to stay in, in NATO if the Americans are doing this to them? I don't know. So it, I, I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. They're so desperate that they are panicking and they're making stupid, reckless moves, and they're going to just precipitate their own decline. Yeah, so I guess in, in desperation, they just create one chaos after another as yeah. a bandage for, you know, just it's... So uh, let me ask you this, um, because you're much more studied on these political issues than me and one of the questions that's been on my mind is to is to ask um what is because of the situation between russia and europe and them not getting russian gas and i'm hearing all sorts of things about you know they're going to have a terrible winter there's going to be an energy crisis what is the minimum effect that's going to take place and how much would this help Russia in terms of its war? So, well, is there a crisis? I guess that's the question. I think there is. Yeah, it looks to me. I mean, I'm not an economist, but the people who are pointing out that it's going to be somewhere between a very, a very bad recession and an, an actual depression uh, are probably right. So I think uh, the European economy is going to be really hit. It'll be maybe comparable to 2008. Uh, I guess we can't exactly compare it with the, the COVID period, but I guess that, that would also be another uh, reference point. And then, of course, there's the Great Depression of 1929 uh, that was uh, perhaps uh, even more of a shock. So, so a, a big shock is definitely coming to Europe 
uh, this winter. And then the question is, will that lead the Europeans to get angry enough about that to break with the US empire? Well, since the pipeline is probably not repairable uh, within the next year, there's nothing they can do about it this year. The whole point of blowing up that pipeline was to make sure that the German industrialists and other uh, and the German people could not opt out of the war on, on Russia through Ukraine and then restore their gas supply and save themselves. So now that that's not an option anymore. And so now it becomes a question of what will be the political ramifications? Will the people rise up against this and uh, demand uh, an end to NATO and stop supporting the war in Ukraine? Uh, I would think so. If I were European, I certainly would. The timing is very interesting because, you know, uh, Russia just annexed these four uh, places. And I think it was a good time to say, okay, let's negotiate, right? Let's try to put an end to this. We've, we've done our part. We did, want, we did what we wanted to do. Um, we've met our objectives or part of our objectives. And so right at that moment where, you know, there was a, a good chance to maybe restart negotiations, these pipelines break up. Uh, the other thing that's happening in Europe, and I wonder what insight you have, is that, you know, people are becoming tired and there's all, all of a sudden these regime changes within Europe, right, uh, with the elections and everything. And so those people that are in Europe, like in Germany, they would be obviously very cautious about, well, you know, uh, if I'm not careful, my own people will kick me out. Uh, but there's, it seems like their powers that be are so adamant that uh, it seems like they don't really care. I don't know if that's the right way or how, how would you read this scenario? Well, I, I think the neoconservatives are in charge now and they have a kind of peculiar, uh, philosophical outlook that is almost indistinguishable from psychopathy. And it's almost like philosophical psychopaths. Uh, <laughs> and so they don't, they don't really believe in democracy. And yeah, they may have a point. We traditionalists are kind of skeptical about democracy too, but we have a different view. Uh, they, we traditionalists uh, basically accept the mainstream of, of the Western philosophical tradition, which is also the Islamic philosophical tradition. Therefore, it's the same thing, of course, which it says, you know, we, we believe in virtue and there's a difference between virtue and vice, uh, between good and evil, uh, between serving Allah and serving the nifs or even the shaitan or the villain. And, and so our analysis of things includes these values and the neocons uh, are committed to a kind of a, a satanic or Nietzschean uh, inversion of values in which they believe that there's no such thing as goodness because they, they're atheists. So if there's no God and there's no metaphysical order and hierarchy in creation, and it's, you know, it's all just accident and, and, and uh, all random without any meaning, then essentially as, as uh, Strauss reads a uh, certain dialogue of Plato's, uh, mm -hmm. that the happy man is not the just man, as Plato said, but rather the man who is uh, good on the outside, but rotten on the inside. The happy man, according to this Leo Straussian interpretation, is, is the man who uh, manages to lie to the world to make them think that he's good, when in fact, he's an evil, scheming psychopath inside, but he's able to, to hide that and get away with it. So that's their ideal. <laughs> and so they're extremely cynical, and they... Uh, clearly don't believe that in any ideals like uh, oh, the will of the people should be respected and democracy is a good thing. They're, they're uh, simply you know, cynical, opportunistic Machiavellians. Uh, and so they probably think that it doesn't really matter what the German people think because we've got the levers of power. You know, we have maybe blackmail material on German leaders. And if there are any that we can't blackmail, we can kill them. And so, uh, 
who cares what the German people think? You know, we can keep them brain. We've brainwashed them since World War II. We've had them totally brainwashed. And there's no sign that they're going to suddenly wake up. So I think they arrogantly think that they can get away with this and dismiss the possibility that anyone would rise up against them in the same way that they figured they could get away with 9-11. Even, you know, I, I think it doesn't look to me like they even planned 9-11 in such a way that they were planning to, to make it difficult to understand what had really happened <laughs> uh, yes. because they didn't have to. Yeah, they're so arrogant that they and and they even say these things. These I forget which ones. There's there there are different neocons like Michael Ledeen, for example. I believe uh, has uh, talked about how you know you know when you the neocon when you you know you do you know these these great evil strokes to promote your country's interests and you you know you do horrible things, horrible crimes, lie to your own people, what you know, murder your own people, whatever it takes, and uh, you don't really have to worry about anybody uh, speaking the truth about you uh, because they'll be afraid to. You know, so their view of, of the human character is that, that people are easily manipulable, uh, lack any kind of courage or integrity. Uh, they're, they're extremely cynical about, uh, about human beings and, and, and about the universe. So I think they tend to dismiss the possibility that enough people would be outraged about something like the 9-11 false flag or uh, what, they're, what they're doing to Ukraine and Russia or what they're doing to Palestine, what they're doing to so many things, uh, they arrogantly think they can get away with it. And, and they often can for a while. But you know, Allah says in the Quran that these people, uh, they, they, you know, it's, Allah gives them some rope yeah. and they can enjoy themselves in the dunya for a while. But then ultimately, it, it comes back to bite them in the end. Uh, and so I think we may be seeing it coming back to bite them before too long. Uh, you know, very certainly, I would guess within our lifetimes, inshallah. So, you know, when, when the U.S. tells Pakistan, for example, we want a base in Pakistan, and Pakistan gives them a base to kill Muslims in Afghanistan, I can to some degree understand that because of the colonial background. Um, I can understand that because I can see the leadership in Pakistan feeling intimidated and giving in. I have, I'm surprised that how Europe has given. Is it, is it, is there any difference between the two? Like between Germany and, well, Britain, I guess also France and all these countries have kind of like just gone along with whatever the U.S. is saying. And the average person can even see that, wait, we might end up in a dead end here with the energy crisis. Like, is it the same or is it different? Or is it completely ideological on that side and it's not intimidation? Yeah, that's an interesting question. No, I, I think there's intimidation on both sides. It's a lot more blatant, though, with Pakistan. Uh, you may recall that after 9-11, uh, we learned that Bush had told Musharraf that he'd better obey orders or he would be bombed back to the Stone Age. That was a direct quote. And Musharraf actually revealed that many years yeah. later. Yeah. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if they told the Saudi leadership the same thing, you know, that uh, and indeed a number of, uh, of Saudi uh, well-placed people uh, died mysteriously after 9-11. So there was a bit of a, a coup d'etat there as well. So, uh, yeah, they, they really uh, obviously are willing to deliver these horrific threats. And then they, they make sure that they uh, show that they can deliver on these threats. They destroy countries, they kill leaders, they overthrow leaders. As for Europe, I think in the past, the US has succeeded in uh, occupying Europe without too much trouble because they've sold the notion that this is a win-win occupation. You know, the mythology of the post-World War II occupation of Europe is, uh, it tells us that the, there was a Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe and the Americans you know, learned their lesson after World, after World War I, they, they messed up and, and the, the victors, the allies uh, demanded all of these reparations from Germany, couldn't be paid. <laughs> And so it led to the rise of Hitler in World War II. So after World War II, the mythology goes that they figured out that they should treat 
Germany well. So they rebuilt its industry, uh, loaned them all kinds of money with the Marshall Plan and rebuilt Europe. And so Europe doesn't really mind being occupied by the Americans because that means the Americans are the ones who have to pay for all of the military stuff. The Europeans, as long as they can have reasonably prosperous societies and have a certain amount of autonomy in terms of their own laws and their own countries, then they're happy. Um, and so that's it looks sort of like a win-win to a lot of Europeans. It has down through the years. And that I don't think that was entirely accurate, but it wasn't completely preposterous either until recently. But now <laughs> that's all changed. Uh, blowing up the pipeline that could bring reasonable, in fact, very cheap energy to Europe at a time when Europe is suffering from a possible, if not a Great Depression, at least a massive recession due to high energy prices. Uh, and then forcing the Europeans to buy uh, energy from the U.S. that's costing 20 times as much as what it would cost from the Russians, that's not win-win. What's happening is the U.S. US is raping and pillaging Europe, and, uh, propping up the dollar by forcing everything out of Europe into, into the U.S. and into the dollar world, keeping the U.S. number one uh, in this U.S.-Europe entity. That's not win-win. So the Europeans now they don't really have a choice. And the question is, why, you know, why have they gone along with this in the past? Well, as I said, as colonial occupations go, they had it pretty easy. <laughs> but now, and not so much. And so we'll see what happens. But uh, it's, it's different in different countries, too, of course. Like France has a tradition of Gaulism. Uh, Jacques Chirac refused to go along with the 9-11 wars. He, he knew that 9-11 was a false flag, and he was disgusted with the whole thing. He knew it was all an Israeli project. And then they overthrew him. Uh, but Germany has never had anybody like de Gaulle or any of these Gaullists. Uh, Germany has been completely brainwashed with, you know, Holocaust guilt and so on. And, uh, you know, they've been made subservient and made a, 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 a group of slaves, basically, who've been brainwashed into, believe, into hating themselves. Mm. Uh, and, and so if Germany ever wakes up, uh, it could be dangerous because the lies that they've been forced to believe about how terrible they are, uh, when those lies get overthrown, you might have a bunch of really angry Germans on your hands again. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see how it all shakes out. Do you have any comments about the white supremacist uh, Nazis in Ukraine and how, from what I'm understanding, how that's affecting the white supremacists all over the world, the KKK in the U.S., uh, the white supremacists in Europe, uh, it's like they are recruiting people to come and fight and they're doing it through the social media and it seems like they're um, doing it through the social media, telling people, you know, they're, so they're promoting the white supremacist ideology and at the same time giving them a channel to come here and fight with us. Uh, I don't know if you've heard anything about this, if you have any comments about this. Uh... Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of how the uh, U.S. empire has used uh, Daesh and Al-Qaeda. Uh, ah, that's so true. <laughs> this is the yeah. Christian version, I guess, of, of, of yeah. ISIS. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, they, <laughs> they love to be able to, you know, deplore the extremists. And use that as a bogeyman to rally the people, you know, against the evil bogeyman. But then they make friends, or they you know, they use the extremists as their own militias and so on in their own wars. So that's kind of a dual role. You know, Al Qaeda served as both a bogeyman and as a U.S. militia, and likewise, Al Qaeda did, or rather, uh, Daesh did too. And now they're doing the same thing with the uh, Ukro Nazis. Uh, and then the question is, how does that fit in with this sort of larger so-called white supremacist movement? Well, you know, this, this so-called white supremacist movement really is, uh, I think, uh, I, I, it's, it's a big umbrella term that sometimes is used against everybody sort of from ordinary Trump supporters, uh, who in many cases are really not particularly racist or, or supremacist. Uh, and you know, then there are these ideal. Trump is more about the average American feeling angry that their jobs have been taken away, and you know they they may blame uh, foreigners for it, but they're not. It's not an ideological thing, right? It's not like 
uh, ideological as versus it, it's more about being against liberalism and more for conservative ideas. And so, yeah, I think there's a big difference between the ideological white supremacy uh, versus Islamophobia sometimes, maybe even from the Republican part, people that mm -hmm. adhere to the Republican Party. But yeah. Well, well, so, some of that is is just sort of uh, like um, you know uh, ethnic uh, solidarity and so on. I, I think to the extent, uh, like a, a lot, it's driven primarily by increasing inequality and the loss of working class jobs. And so the working class white population, uh, like the working class black population, for example, or other working class populations, has seen its relative standard of living decline quite a lot. Uh, over the last several decades. I'd say the white people have seen the biggest decline. But they probably have. And they, they've, what they we have know seen, is they... After uh, the 2007 housing crisis, I think mm -hmm. it was like 47, majority of that's all white, you know, losing their houses and... Yeah, and, and that's led to a decline in life expectancy. Uh, there, there's, for the first time ever, even before COVID, U.S. life expectancy started declining. And that decline was driven entirely by white working class people uh, losing a significant chunk of their life expectancy, as in years. And a lot of that was driven by the opioid uh, epidemic, which was put out by uh, suspiciously often Zionist owned big pharma entities. Uh, and some, you know, you can find quotes of from certain uh, highly placed uh, people of a sort of a neocon Zionist persuasion saying that, well, you know, they're kind of useless eaters, right? Uh, but it's not really that sad to see these people losing their life expectancy and dying from opioids because we don't need those jobs anymore. You know, we can do that with robots or send it to China. Uh, and so you can see why those people are angry. But uh, it, some of that's been channeled in a racial or ethnic direction. The ideology then has, has come in, you know, people have come in like Jared Taylor and Kevin McDonald our intellectuals who've stepped in with this sort of ideology that says that, hey, it's natural to support your own ethnicity. And they don't really believe in very much other than Darwin and ethnicity. So that's kind of all they have to rally their group around. Uh, and, and so that's what they do. And I, I, I find that overall to be a, a mistake, uh, obviously. The uh, African-Americans have actually probably suffered the most of anybody from these negative trends, uh, both the destruction of working class jobs and the destruction of the traditional family. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the white, yeah, so called, yeah, yeah, the white uh, activists uh, are very, you know, they're right about this. They're angry about the destruction of jobs, they're angry about the destruction of the family. Well, and, and instead of hating on black people, uh, why don't they notice that it's been even worse for the black people? They've had it even worse. Uh, but no, they they choose the path of ethnic division. And I think I really think that's a terrible mistake. Um, and in fact, I think uh, Islam and in, in particular, but even, you know, just traditional religion in general has a bit of a solution to that in that, uh, you know, we uh, we have some uh, framework uh, that is beyond simply imagining the world as nothing but ethnic strife. And indeed, Islam came at a time when, when there was this endless ethnic strife. The, the tribes in Arabia were always fighting each other mo most of the months of the year, except for the sacred truce months. And then Islam came and made everybody the member of the same super tribe, right? Uh, and I think we, we need something like that. And I also think this, what, this ethnic uh, consciousness has been largely fostered by the billionaires who uh, profit from it. You know, they they want to be able to get away with continuing all of these destructive trends. And if the whole working class rises up against them, that's what could threaten them. But if they can get all of the you know, get some, you know, divide everybody, get the, the white racists against the black uh, ethnic supremacists, and then get the white liberals, you know, fighting against the white racists and, and uh, the left versus the right. And most of the working class is now on the right and voting for the Republicans, uh, who are the, usually traditionally the party of make, giving everything to the billionaires. So all of this works out very well for the, you know, the oligarchs who are running the show. It's very interesting you say that because that reminds me of ion number two, of Sutul Qasas, where it says, Inna ala fil ard, that Fir'aun was putting himself high on, in the world 
And he جعل أهلها شيعا. He made the people divided into different groups, you know, uh, to keep them under his uh, feet. And so, yeah, as 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 the economy goes down, people are more upset and they want to take out their anger. There, you know, we America. I know we were going to talk about Russia, but I'm just saying as a side point that America is so polarized now that you know we'll be blaming each other rather than blaming the where the blame goes <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take out uh our our energy and our frustration at the wrong place uh coming back to russia uh let me ask you this question is another question that's been on my mind which is that do you think there is a relationship between present day ukraine and the khazaria empire well, that's a great question well, of course, present-day Ukraine is the site of the so-called Pale of Settlement, which is where the majority of the European Jewish population uh, lived throughout the recent history, past, past several centuries. So if the, the European Jews are interested in returning to their genuine ancestral homeland, that would be Ukraine. It wouldn't be Palestine. Mm. These people are Europeans, uh, whether they're Khazars or other Europeans, and there's a big you know, discussion about their genetics. Um, and there probably is a little bit of Palestinian DNA there, of course, too. But the, ultimately, they're, they're, you know, they're really Europeans. And uh, the Ukraine is where their ancestors came from. And now, is this a factor? Some people believe that uh, the Zionists who are occupying Palestine are worried that they may have to leave and that they will lose their war on Palestine and on the region. And they would like to have a place to go. And so according to this discourse, they've explored places like uh, Patagonia and, and other places, but they're interested possibly in moving en masse to Ukraine, having another diaspora. But I don't know, uh, that, that strikes me as a bit far-fetched. I, I think more likely, to the extent that there's a sort of a, a Jewish and Zionist angle to this Ukraine, this war on Russia through Ukraine, it might have to do partly with ancient ethnic hatreds, just as the big new Brzezinski, the Polish nobleman who came to America to work out his hatred of Russia through US foreign policy, was doing using US foreign policy to, to push his personal agenda. Likewise, the people like Blinken, uh, and uh, these other Jewish neocons, the Kagan family in Newland, uh, these people who've created this war on Russia through Ukraine are uh, from, you know, they're Jews from that region, Eastern European Jews who have a deep-seated ethnic hatred of Russia and of, of non-Jewish Ukrainians and Poles, just as Brzezinski had his ancient ethnic hatred of Russia. Mm -hmm. So I think that you can partly explain the anti-Russian foreign policy under Brzezinski in the Carter administration through Brzezinski's ethnic hatred, you can also partly explain the fanatical extreme anti-Russian foreign policy today through these uh, Jew Eastern European Jews who are running the show and are destroying, you know, trying to destroy, lashing out and destroying Russia and Ukraine. And if they get a chance to harm Poland, I wouldn't put it past them either. Does Israel benefit from this uh you know, uh, Western civilizations inter, uh, like Eastern side versus Western side, this clash that's happening. Does Israel benefit from this in any significant way? Yeah, that's an interesting question. They certainly benefit from having a stranglehold on the US empire. Uh, they've had an increasing stranglehold on the US empire. Uh, they didn't own it under Eisenhower. Um, Eisenhower uh, actually went against the Israelis during the Suez Crisis and forced them to give up their war that they were waging with France and Britain. And then the Israelis probably contributed to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Some even see them as in the lead role. And uh, the Israeli agent or pro-Israel man Johnson was put in charge in order to be there for the 1967 war, which had been planned long in advance by people like Ben Gurion. Uh, so that was, uh, part, there's been a gradual takeover of power over U.S. foreign policy, especially Middle East policy by uh, Zionists. 
and of course 9-11 was kind of the the final <laughs> straw there uh since 9-11 they the neocon zionists have completely dominated u.s foreign policy and especially Middle east policy and their ideology was you know a lot of these people were originally trotskyites and anti-war and then they noticed that hey we need a strong u.s empire to protect israel if we uh you know have lower military spending and, and the u.s doesn't project its empire so forcefully then israel is in serious danger uh, that was the way they thought. So they got interested in all of this uh, scheming and becoming radically hawkish and uh, pushing huge military budgets and then you, you know, hijacking the U.S. military to smash Israel's enemies, which, of course, 9-11 was the ultimate example of that. Uh, and so I, I think that's actually uh, kind of where, you know, where this is all coming from and whether Israel actually profits from, uh, from you know, the U.S., fighting uh, Russia and China and Iran all at once, which seems like a pretty stupid idea for if you're, you know, if you're a U.S. <laughs> imperialist. Uh, and so you might even wonder whether these neocon uh, Jewish Zionists who are running U.S. foreign policy might be intentionally destroying the U.S. empire. I and mean, it's sort of like one, you know, one way of looking at this would be, this, as I said earlier, this seems really reckless and self-destructive. I really do feel being in America, that it's like almost shooting yourself in the foot over and over again. Everything from Black Lives Matters to all the other wake, whether it's the wake movement, whether it's the flat earth movement, it's just, it's like they're just destroying their own foundations at so many levels. Uh, and, and no one trusts anyone. No one trusts the cops. No one trusts authority. No one trusts the politicians. And then you got non-experts like uh, Bill Gates talking about medicine and then you got you know celebrities talking about physics and flat earth and it's just everything's upside down uh, and and no one trusts anyone uh, and yeah and, and and they blame the internet they blame the conspiracy theorists but it's actually it's the the leadership that's caused the problem <laughs> yeah it's like what you said, like, you know, dividing everybody against each other. And this is just another form of that same phenomenon. And so, okay, so coming back to, uh, do you, what do you think is Russia's options at this point? And what is their strength? Because it, it does seem like that, um, you know, in the beginning, Russia was kind of winning and then boom like this big wave and they had to pull back even though it does seem like they pulled back in a strategic way way I mean, it was strategically done and then they had this referendum and now this where how do you see this play out from here what are the options russia has uh are they just going to keep pumping pu uh, pumping money in and just recruiting people and keep just the pressure on them how do you see this play out well i would think russia would mostly continue to do what it's been doing uh it it has retreated from some territory but it's the uh the these uh new parts of russia that just held these referenda and are now rejoining russia uh are likely to um to to be fully russian i think for for the foreseeable future now of course there's there's still uh, a part of that territory that is occupied by Ukraine. And that creates a situation where the Russian strategic doctrine, which is that nuclear weapons can be used to defend Russian territory when it's under threat. Well, now there is Russian territory under threat. And of course, the other side doesn't view it as Russian territory. So it creates a, a more dangerous situation. And um, I think so far, it seems that Russia has been playing the long game, um, assuming that over time, the ability of uh, the Western powers to continue pumping these uh, huge amounts of weapons into Ukraine and, uh, and, and training them and so on, it'll uh, eventually um, run up against all kinds of things, including this coming economic uh, recession or depression that's going to hit Europe this winter. And uh, at some point, they will have to go ahead and reach a negotiated peace which will undoubtedly leave the territory that, that is now Russian, it'll still be Russian. Uh, and whether, you know, whether Russia is you know, thinking that it's going to have to meet further escalations 
Uh, that's a that's a possibility. I think I'm sure they have you know these militaries draw up contingency plans for all sorts of possibilities. And I think Russia waited until now to to do what it well it it, it felt it it had it felt like it had to do what it what it's done uh, because of a, a number of things. Of course, the uh, the Western threat to bring Ukraine into NATO. Uh, the uh, ramping up of the war on the Donbass, the massive increase in artillery barrage, which appeared to be a prelude to a Ukrainian invasion, and uh, uh, and, and other things. So they uh, they had they felt like they had to go ahead and make their move now, but they they were able to do it be, partly because I think they believe that they have uh, a uh, sort of escalation dominance or at least escalation parity with the U.S., which means that whatever the U.S. does, they can match it. Uh, all the way up to, of course, blowing up the planet <laughs> in the yeah. Melhammer. Uh, so uh, that where where it's all going to go, I don't know. But it does seem to me that in the long run, these changes are inevitable. That is, it, I, I just can't imagine how the Anglo-Zionist empire of, of usury is going to change the fact that the uh, the economic trends favor the rest of the world you know they're they've been losing their share of gdp uh slowly but steadily over decades and decades and decades and they're still acting as though they completely own and dominate the world and so i think you know, one way or another it's going to play out as a wake-up call that is going to end in if not uh if not the melhama and inshallah will well, melhama will be put off as long as possible or inshallah mm -hmm. maybe 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 that's an erroneous interpretation i mean we don't only allah knows these things uh but you know i i would certainly personally be much happier to see things move in the direction of a multipolar world with uh fully independent sovereign nations that are interested in cooperating and trading with each other in order to confront the real challenges that we're facing uh in, you know we need to tweak our technology uh in such a way as to have create better lives for human beings and also preserve nature that's there are huge challenges and this, these wars are getting in the way of the challenges and of course the the americans would say if we allow you guys to win and we end up with a world of fully sovereign nations rather than us the, the hegemon running everything you guys are going to quarrel and you're going to have wars and we're going to have a you know it'll be it'll be worse that way it's better to have a, a leviathan as hobbes would say you know one power to control them all one ring <laughs> to, to rule them all uh, so I, I i side with the multipolar people and I, I it looks to me like china russia and iran are not particularly interested in wars of aggression and expansion they're interested in trade development technology building railroads uh and making the world better whereas the american empire is interested in killing and killing and killing to force everybody to take worthless green paper so they can build more weapons to kill more people so to me, it's a no-brainer. We have to cheer for the multipolar world people. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a verse in the Quran, "Fa'zanu biharbi min Allahi wa Rasulihi." No, Allah declares a war against interest, as you know. And what's interesting uh, is that the amount of money it takes to launch war, you know, uh, it's very easy to print money print money, print money, and go to war, because if you're printing money, then, because wars were not, wars were very expensive, right? So you can't wage war with 10 countries at one time. Like, it would be like maximum you're waging one war, because it's going to take so much money. Now you just have a printing machine, you print and you go to war, but at the same time, you're making this debt. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask that, do you think this cycle of riba, because obviously they have to print more money to keep wars going on. The economy for the average person is going down. Where do you think, do you think that there's a break? What would be the breaking point as far as printing money is concerned, as far as um, at what point does the paper money actually become useless i guess 
Well, I don't know if it becomes completely useless all at once, but I think we're already at the point where it's uh, there's a crisis. And we can look back historically to see a predecessor for this crisis uh, in, in my lifetime. In the 1960s, uh, the Johnson administration spent vast amounts of money on both uh, social programs and the war in Vietnam. And I, I took a course in US economic history uh, years and years and years ago at the University of Wisconsin. And that was one of the centerpieces of the course was that Johnson had made a terrible mistake by thinking that he could get away with spending that much money both domestically and uh, in Vietnam. And that led to the stagflation of the 1970s. And stagflation was this phenomenon in which the economy was actually not growing fast or even shrinking, but at the same time there was inflation. And that's never been seen, you know, normally, if there's if it's inflationary, there's also growth. But if you have this stagflation, it's the worst of both worlds, and it it it's a terrible economic situation. And is that really, what we have it, right now? Kind of. Yeah, that's what we're moving into right now for the same reason because they're spending all of this money on both the military and this, particularly the war in Ukraine and uh, the COVID payouts. Uh, with COVID, they just yeah. threw you know vast amounts of money everywhere. And now Biden has been uh, spending, you know, like a proverbial drunken sailor. So just like Lyndon Johnson spending a lot of money domestically and for a big foreign war, that's what they're doing now. And here we are seeing stagflation again. Have you heard of the term Khazarian mafia? <laughs> yes. Yeah, my friend, uh, Dr. Preston James, who sometimes writes for Veterans Today, uh, is uh, a specialist in writing about the so-called Khazarian mafia. I mean, I, to me, the, I think they're just using the word Khazarian uh, so they don't have to use the J word, because if you use the right. J word, people will throw rotten fruit at you and get you deplatformed. Uh, but let's face it, there are ethnic mafias. You know, I, I was just talking with an Albanian guy the other day, and he knows very well that there's a, you know, there's a sort of Albanian mafia, maybe more than one. If you go to Chicago, you can go to each neighborhood and see the ethnic mafias for each of these ethnicities. The Jewish mafia traditionally, uh, call it Hazarian if you want, <laughs> has been the banker for the other mafias. You know, Meyer Lansky was the banker for the mafia during his lifetime, and he may have been the most powerful man in America. And he was also an Israeli agent. Uh, and he was like the Jeffrey Epstein of his day and that he had dirty pictures of, of J. Edgar Hoover, who in turn had dirty pictures of all the politicians. So Meyer Lansky could uh, basically run whoever he wanted uh, through Hoover. Uh, and uh, so the organized crime often has these ethnic ties. So if we're going to talk about uh, a Khazarian mafia, which again, I, I, it's, it's ethnically Jewish, it's not religiously Jewish. These people are, are usually not very religious. They're even less religious than the you know Italian Catholic mafiosi you see as Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, sure. That I mean, Jewish organized crime is huge. It's real, and they're probably the most powerful organized crime syndicate on the planet. Uh, do you have any comments about the bio labs? Yeah, the the. Well, there were Ukrainian biolabs, but there are also biolabs in Georgia. Uh, Tbilisi has perhaps the worst one that's been involved in all sorts of criminal stuff. Uh, and uh, around uh, the, the stands uh, uh, that you know, wherever the Americans can put their put these these biolabs, they have. And then the U.S. is also now full of uh, very dangerous biological weapons labs. After the anthrax false flag attack of 2001, it was in October 2001, just about the, the time we're at right now was when the anthrax letters were coming in, early October, uh, coming, you know, these letters said, death to America, death to Israel, Allah is great. But now even the American government admits that this was a false flag. It wasn't really a Muslim that did it. It was uh, somebody who wanted to blame Muslims in the American bio war community. Mm. But regardless, they use this to terrorize everybody and whip up Islamophobia and to massively increase the biowar budget. So uh, the, our own biowar community killed a bunch of Americans, terrorized the American Senate. Patrick Leahy uh, got anthrax letters. Uh, they, they, they used it to force through the Patriot Act. And, and then, uh, rather than blaming the American biowar community and cutting their budget, as they should have, they increased the biowar budget something like 800%. And so instead of two level four biolabs, which they used to have, now there's a whole bunch of them and lots of level three ones too, all over the U.S. and, and abroad. And so the U.S. Biological Weapons Program is by far the biggest in the world. They've spent over $100 billion on it. 
the U.S. has used these bioweapons in anger many times, and we can surmise that from uh, a number of books, uh, including Baseless by Nicholson Baker, that goes over the history of U.S. bioattacks on Korea, Cuba, uh, Eastern Europe, and other places, which uh, they're still trying to keep that secret by keeping all the, the files under cover. Uh, and uh, in, in any case, there are serial biological warfare criminals running these programs, and uh, there are good reasons to suspect that COVID stemmed from a biological attack on China and Iran, and Ron Unz's book on that subject is a must read, and people can find that at UNZ, unz.com. Uh, so yeah, this is a, a huge threat to humanity, obviously. Uh, gain of function research, meaning tweaking viruses to be more virulent, uh, to kill more people, to harm more people, is just a terrible thing to do, uh, obviously. And uh, and still, you know, our tax money is paying for it. Um, and you know, I, of all of the things that we should have a, a, a move, a citizens' movement trying to change, this is up near the top of the list. Uh, just for my viewers, um, if you go to um, it, it says Kevin Barrett, uh, or it, wasn't it not the truth? Uh, yeah, if you go to truthjihad.com, it redirects you to this uh, heresy central so site. Truth, truthjihad.com. So that's where yeah. you want to go. Okay. Yeah, if you go there, truth it redirects jihad. you, but you, that's so still my page. If you want to learn from uh, Brother Kevin, then go to his website and check it out and donate and, you know, listen to his talk, radio talk shows um and subscribe subscribe and i think you can also become a hat hat patron is it called patreon uh no patreon kicked me out uh oh, so okay. Uh, okay. i now have a Substack. people can find me at uh, kevin oh, barrett uh, kevin barrett okay. Substack .com. okay okay good and inshallah people can find you there and uh just so please do go over here and uh, try to um, benefit from it. And also don't just benefit, but also give. This is our tradition from the Prophet وسلم, that we don't just take, we also give. So people that give you knowledge, people that give you understanding, uh, you should give back to them, inshallah. Um, is there any important questions about Russia and Ukraine that I didn't ask? Um, well, not that I can think of uh, offhand. I guess we didn't mention the Christian revival in Russia, which Sheikh oh. Ramon Hossein says we should be yes. very much uh, yeah, sympathetic please, with. Please, yeah. yes, uh, say something about that. Yes, I, well, we've talked about the divide and conquer problem, and uh, they've really tried to divide uh, Christians against Muslims, and 9-11 was, was partly about that. Uh, and as Muslims, we can see that as Russia gets past its communist atheist period and starts to slowly tentatively return to its traditional Christian heritage, that this is overall a good thing. And that some of these extremely decadent uh, and shaitani aspects of Western culture are being limited and pushed back uh, in an increasingly Christian Russia. And this is something that, that Muslims should be sympathetic with. Uh, so I think Sheikh Imran Hussein is, is uh, on the right track about that. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. Um, and I suspect that Russia has the advantage even now, you would say? Uh, you mean the military advantage? Military, as well as the human advantage in the sense mm -hmm. that, uh, or even financial, financial, human, and military. If you were to look at the overall situation, who do you think is in a better position right now? Well, uh, I think I think overall uh, uh, Russia is because uh, I think the civilizational trend is upward in Russia uh, and it's downward in the West. Mm. Subhanallah. So you would tell Muslim countries like Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Turkey, Kazakhstan, or mu Muslim countries that they need to um, be on, they need to change their uh i guess foreign policy to to be on good terms with russia maybe even china and uh 
rely put less eggs in the basket of the West? Yes, I mean they should, of course. I think pursue a balanced policy that puts the interests of their own people um, first. Well, maybe put Allah and and justice first. Uh, if but politicians rarely do that. But in any case, uh, I think trying to pursue a reasonable and balanced policy would entail uh, refusing to allow the Americans to come in and run the place and establish bio bio labs. Uh, and so on, and and uh, also kick out the IMF if possible, and work more with the alternative organizations that are growing up. I think uh, Imran Khan was on the right track and is on the right track in Pakistan, and it would be wonderful if we could see more leaders who are honest. Uh, Imran Khan, whether whatever you think about him, uh, he's an honest politician, and that's pretty rare. So, uh, in inshallah, there will be more people uh, like that who will try to pursue honest policies. And when they do, the first people to come after them will unfortunately probably be the Americans. Yeah, yeah, especially now that they're getting desperate. I mean, it seems to me now they're so desperate, they're even putting, they just put sanctions on India right. for uh, buying oil from Russia. Or I just forget what the exact cause was, but they did put sanctions on one of the Indian companies or India itself, I'm not sure. Uh, because of, you know, siding with Russia. Well, 90% of the world isn't respecting the sanctions, so they're going to end up sanctioning themselves. If you sanction 90% of the world, you're really <laughs> sanctioning yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's right. And so it's, it's a really terrible situation, uh, especially, you know, with the amount of earthquakes and hurricanes and just natural disasters and then you got so many political conflicts. And then right in the center, you got this big war going on that's just escalating. And uh, we get dumber and dumber politicians in, in, with all of this happening. And so it's, it's like almost like the countdown has begun. It seems that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and one more thing uh, is that, you know, the United States has a tradition uh, of uh, this democratic republicanism with a, a, a bill of rights and so on. And, you know, that's been rolled back, but people still believe in it to a certain extent. And that means it's still true to a certain extent. So as Muslim Americans, I think we should try to correct the course of this uh, extremely decadent empire. And I I think one way to frame it that many non-Muslim Americans would find congenial is we need to end the empire and restore the republic. Mm. You know, the U.S. wasn't meant to be an empire. It was born in a revolt against empire. And people like George Washington, John Quincy Adams, and great many others have always been staunch anti-imperialists. And they are, they're rolling over in their graves right now looking at what the U.S. empire is doing. Yeah, so, <laughs> so let's end the empire, restore the republic. And I think if Muslims Actually, say that... You know, such, a, such a good point from even a Dawah perspective. If Muslim intellectuals took the lead in rather than being part of the institutional setup uh, of the structure that exists, but to be critical of it, you know, speak the truth, speak the truth that's in, I think, in the heart of many Muslims regarding, for example, 9-11, right? And uh, speak the truth in terms of what's, not speak the truth of what the institutions expect from you or what the powers of the power structure expects from you, but speak the truth of for that's already in the hearts of many Americans. I mean, they many Americans would respect Muslims if they heard Muslims saying 9-11 was false because there's so many people that are against these or, or see through these, right? And 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 if I don't see mainstream Muslims in Isna and Ikna and other places taking that stance, I, I simply see them working with the power structures that be, rather than taking a stance against the power structures and winning the hearts of Americans by doing that. I think there's a more of a, a very high chance of winning the hearts of Americans if you go against the power structure. But if you stay with the power structure, you're you're not going to win the masses, nor are you going to make the power structures happy. 
Yes, I, I think that's true. I think there's a lot of uh, Islamophobia right now coming from the right wing. Parts of that right wing are becoming, they're actually kind of waking up to some of these things, but then they see, they imagine that Muslims are close friends with, you know, LGBTQ, with the establishment, with the, the people pushing the wars, uh, with the big financial forces. You know, they, they see them, that Muslims are part of this establishment, and then they think, well, there's this conspiracy to replace us normal Americans with these Muslim immigrants who are so foreign and different from us, and, you know, they're good friends with all these, these people who are destroying America. That's what I hear from a lot of the more conservative type Americans. I can and, sympathize with that, because anything that becomes special interest, you know, other than maybe the NRA situation which is a little bit more complicated but you know gays and lesbians blacks uh jews uh all these other special interests i think you know they become institutionalized right and once you become institutionalized once you're a special interest and muslims are following the same footsteps as the jews in america in a sense that they want to become institutionalized uh, but th but their understanding of becoming mainstream and becoming institutionalized, they haven't made that distinction. That we're not becoming mainstream Americans, in a sense. We're just becoming institutionalized. And by becoming institutionalized, all we're doing is we're alienating ourselves from the American people itself. And uh, I think that's one of the you know we we could have done so many great things in this country in terms of dawah and we had so many opportunities of dawah but we were so much in a survival mode i guess because of islamophobia because of 9 11 that we lost the ball because all these situations were also opportunities to speak the truth and so if we would have spoken the truth back then in 9 11 People would have been realizing, oh, yeah, that's what the Muslims were saying back then. And they would have had those sympathies for us that we would have had to suffer in the beginning. But then the. And it's still I think there's still time at least to do some of that, that if uh, organizations like ISNA and CARE and uh, ICNA, they stood up and just spoke the truth, not from an in, not from an not just seeking to become institutionalized but from the perspective of okay if we speak the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the others to see that we're speaking the truth so yes, that, any, that's that's the Quranic model that's uh the the Quran the Quran is full of consolation of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam uh that yeah the people won't hear you right away that you know when you you tell the truth uh, there's a the powerful will will not listen and then they will do if you know they'll treat you badly um, but you still have to do it <laughs> and you know inshallah ultimately you can you can have success yeah any last words and advice well uh i i'm really happy to, that you are providing this kind of uh chance for dialogue uh and i think we need more honest uh dialogue about especially about these kinds of controversial issues um and it's really refreshing to speak uh with uh with a muslim scholar like yourself who is uh fully uh sincerely willing to courageously talk about what needs to be talked about so um, I'm, i really appreciate your work and uh and i appreciate your work I, do for me inshallah that uh, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my sheikh used to say I don't know the words in a different language but not be deceived you know not not to get tricked not to be deceived and stay the course and and the same thing for you I you know I'm so happy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed people like you to exist and uh, I'm hoping since you're good friends with brother Charles Upton uh, that you and him can maybe make a small dent uh, along the way. Let's see what happens. Uh, inshallah. Yes, I hope, I'd love to come come on with you and have a, a conversation with him and you at the same time. It would be very interesting. Yes, very interesting. Okay, thank you so much. Inshallah, I will invite you again, um, and we'll just take it from there.
Okay, well, I look forward to that, inshallah. Well, thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.